episode 101 of Inside the Mind podcast. Uh, privileged to be joined by Jane Channel, who, I mean, when I think about mentally tough athletes in, in the Canadian Olympic program and, and athletes have, that have competed in the Olympics, um, just just an honor to have you on. I appreciate it. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me today. I'm really excited for this. Of course. Thanks. Thanks. I know you're you're fresh off your bronze medal win. Um, what is it, about a month or so ago has been the time for him? Uh, something like that. Something. I've lost track of the days. <laughs> I know that. Um, I mean, I bring that up because kind of going through your social media and kind of hearing you reflect on it, you really focused on the process and not the outcome. And when I think about just the mental approach to sports, I feel like that's one of the go-to lessons for athletes to learn is to focus on the process and not the outcome. For you specifically for that World Cup event, what? how would you define like the process? Like what do you kind of mean by the process in that? Um, I mean, in the past, I've put so much pressure on myself. And so well, coming into this season, um, one of the silver linings of COVID for me was um, – the time to be able to reflect and to work on that mental game and, and that process. And so, um, preseason, um, I guess we, our Federation decided not to send us out to Europe for that first half of the season. And so I spent most of my time out in Whistler sliding with, uh, the younger athletes, the snipers, um, out there and just getting back to the basics of why I started sliding in the first place. And, um, because it's fun and just, trying to live that and breathe that and so trying to then take that um that lightness i guess into the world cup season um was something that really helped me um to excel in that first race there Mm -hmm. yeah i see it i hear it so often in the media and talking to other athletes as well it kind of seems like the more into their sport they get the higher they get sometimes there might be a tendency to get away from the basics and i think every athlete at one point or another they kind of go through a bit of a revelation where they realize like i'm kind of straying away from the basics let me get back to it and then i mean the results come right after that 99 times out of 100. yeah 100 percent. and like i've heard it time and time again and seen the the blogs and the posts about it as well and so um it is a really hard zone to stay in though. And so um, part of the struggle um, and work that I'm going to be do was doing and still will be continuing to do is to um, how can you stay there without it being forced? Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's so, it's so hard for for either yourself or for other athletes out there to, to stay in that zone? Um, I think because once, when you get that first result, when you get that success, um, there's now, or you feel like there's now expectation with that comes pressure. And so whether that be you yourself putting that on you or external pressure from sponsors or coaches or federations or or teammates, friends, family, whatever it may be, but um, really for me, myself, I'm my own worst enemy. And so I'm, I'm my hardest critic. And so it's, it's, how do you, how do you get yourself to that point where you are your biggest supporter instead of your, your enemy? hundred percent. I love that. Cause it, it reminded me, I did a podcast episode maybe a couple months ago um, with Courtney Steven on the Hamilton tiger cats. And he had a really cool quote that he said, no one could put more pressure on you than you put on yourself. And I think it goes both ways where you can at times be your own critic, worst critic, I should say, but also it's, I think, you have the ability to block out the pressure from everybody else. And as long as you only listen to yourself and what you want, thing becomes that much easier to not feel the pressure from others. And like you said, enjoy and have fun because if we're not having fun with what we're doing, whether it's sports, podcast, life, work, family, whatever it is, if it's not fun, I think you got got to like really think about, is this something I want to do? hundred percent. Yeah. That, that reflection part to, to really see if, if you are loving your sport or if you're just loving the idea or the concept of it. And so it's, uh, it's definitely a battle for sure. <laughs> you mentioned too, you kind of had some opportunity to work on, on the mental game and specifically, like we said, the process, is that something that you usually do? Like it's a self-guided kind of journey or do you, have you ever worked with a mental coach or sports psychologist? I've worked with sports psychologists. Um, I've worked with a few of them. Um, and, finding the right fit is, is 
is super important for anyone out there that is thinking about it. And so I guess you kind of have to shop around, which seems like a really funny concept, but <laughs> it, it is super important for, your, for you to have that confidence and um, knowing that whoever it is that you're talking to um, is a good fit. And as well, though, this summer, um, even though I was working with a sports psych, um, it was more so, of, I guess, a self-guided um, adventure this summer. Just, I was super busy with work and just the time just seemed to fly by, but I, the time that I did have seemed to be I don't know, late at night or some time that was inconvenient to make a phone call or anything. So yeah. Um, just, yeah, just kind of accepting it and being able to um, forgive myself, I guess, in, in a sense, or just, um, I'm not really sure the process exactly of it, but, um, yeah, I, I did a lot of work this summer. Um, and it, it has added up for sure. I think that's such a challenge for, I think for most Olympic athletes, this isn't your, like your job, nine to five job is, is skeleton per se, right? Like a lot of people have that other job on the side to so to fit it in. I think it makes it that much more impressive. And I mean, speaking to the choir there when you said like the time just flies by and then it feels like all you have to do is at night. Like for me personally, even recently with the work, it gets so busy and then six, seven o'clock and I finally have a moment to breathe and it's like, wow, I got to like meditate. I got to do yoga. I got to stretch. I got to go to the gym, whatever it is. I've tried more and more to get myself to wake up like earlier in the morning, five or 6 a.m. to do it. But I'm like the least far away thing from being a morning person. So it's just super difficult to do that. <laughs> I know there was a, uh, for a bit in the summertime when I was just super busy, um, I was getting up at five in the morning to go and do my training oh, before it yeah. got super hot. Um, but I, <laughs> I actually stopped that because I had a really weird, um, encounter with, with someone at the park I would go run at. And so I ended up just not doing yeah. that anymore so um i thought it would be safer if i didn't so i <laughs> resorted Sometimes back to daylight's a good in. thing yeah yes exactly yeah <laughs> i love that um when you kind of think back to your career and really just kind of i think every athlete goes through adversity but when you think back to your career is there a moment in your career where adversity really seemed to shape you to to the athlete and the person that you are today yeah, hundred percent. Um, I think for me, that moment was, um, back before my skeleton days back, um, back actually in my track and field days at Simon Fraser university. And, um, it's when I had lost my boyfriend, um, back in November of 2009. And, um, he was the biggest advocate of dreaming big and then dreaming even bigger after that and fully challenging yourself to, just put yourself out there and to um, give it everything you have with no regrets. And without him, I would not be where I am today. Mm -hmm. um, after graduating university, I'd be fine with leaving sports, leaving that competitive atmosphere. And um, instead, I wasn't done with sports. And so with having his influence and taking a chapter out of his book, um, that's when I moved up to Whistler without ever having tried skeleton before in the fall of 2011 and said, this is what I'm going to do. What it like, what an, like an incredible leap of faith that is to go into a sport that you have no experience with. And just to take that leap of faith I think that takes, and you know, I think that really speaks to not only like the value of self-confidence, but the value of surrounding yourself with the right people. And, and I think every athlete, they can count on those two, three, four, five, maybe in some cases, just that one person, but that, that person or that group of people that pushes them to that extra step and gives them that confidence in their potential to, to live the best life they can as an athlete and as a person. hundred percent. I, I agree. It's a, um, I feel really privileged and honored to be able to have known him. So it's something that's super special. And I know that like, my friends and family as well have helped um, this whole journey with supporting, <laughs> even though um, like who, who just uproots themselves to go and try the sport they've never tried before. <laughs> so um, my family's been also like my number one supporter. So it's, yeah. it's been super special and amazing to have them along this journey. I got to imagine it's tough too. I mean, in the sport like skeleton and just at the nature of being, an Olympic athlete, because I mean, 
out of, for example, 10 competitions throughout the year, how many are in Canada? Probably not many. Like you're traveling all over the world, right? So I think to have that that home base and those people to count on, I got to imagine for someone in your position, it just means the world. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like we, I mean, Canada, we only have one working track now. The Calgary track has been half blown up and there's no talk as to when they're going to renovate it and fix it back up again. And then there's two tracks in the States, one in Park City, Utah, and one in like Placid, New York. And so we'll be lucky if we have a World Cup race in Whistler and then one in the States. So we're really only in town for preseason and postseason sliding with maybe that odd week or two in North America. Otherwise we're out in Europe mostly. Yeah. That's got to be even frustrating too. Just like just that level of uncertainty as, as an athlete, not knowing kind of what the future holds in terms of events and whatnot. Cause some, for something like, for example, like the NHL, like it's clear there's Stanley cup playoffs for the NFL, there's going to be a super bowl, but for a lot of sports out there, I think COVID kind of really has messed things up a lot just in terms of that uncertainty. Yeah, it, it has for sure. But it's, it's really taught me to, how fluid you have to be and how just rolling with the punches you have to go with it. And so um, when I did go to Germany, I I had no idea if everything was going to get shut down the day after I got there, or if we would actually be able to, to have our our races. Like there's so many rumors that float around just with regards to, Oh, like Switzerland's going to close or Austria is going to close. Germany is going to shut down. Like what's going to happen. And so um, I think just kind of taking everything with a grain of salt until it actually comes like the policies or whatever may be coming to effect um, was super important um, to be able to just kind of remain staying in that moment and focusing on what's important now. For sure. And, and I love how you mentioned remaining fluid. I think that's such, again, like one of those key lessons for athletes to kind of start to learn when, they, if they want to better their career, how do you, how do you personally stay fluid? Is there something that you tell yourself like daily that you kind of practice daily to stay fluid? Is it something that you tell yourself when something unexpected happens? Just how do you guys overall remain fluid? Um, I mean, it's hard. It's hard not to get <laughs> caught up with, with the rumors. That's for yeah. sure. And, and overreacting. And, um, it's, it, it's one of those things, I guess, where you going to just have to accept things for how they are. And, um, yeah, just to, to not, make any um sudden decisions and be able to have that even if it's like an hour or two to just kind of think things through um and then of course that waiting game where everyone gets antsy and um kind of anticipates things that may or may not happen is is really difficult so honestly i think just just to kind of let let the rumors roll off your back until things actually come to fruition for sure. For sure. Do you feel like that's, that's the part of your journey as an athlete mentally where you've improved the most, the most, sorry, remaining fluid, or is there another aspect in terms of your mentality where you feel like over the, cause I know you've been in the sport for probably about 11 years now, right? Since 2010, 2011 ish. Are there other aspects of your mental game where you feel like you've improved even more? I think so. I think, um, like, yes, of course, being fluid is something that everyone's had to, um, morph and change into and accept this year but throughout the years one of the biggest um mental winnings i guess if you want to call it that that i've i'm still learning and um trying to accept is that um that self-confidence and knowing that like you are good enough to be there um that you do have the skills to compete with the best like you are where you're supposed to be and that that so just that self confidence I guess that self worth and, and answering those questions of like why am I actually doing this like do I enjoy it <laughs> and because like those those down days those times when you have like those um those like awful training days or whatever like you just have to remember that those bad days make the good days great and um it's it's been a hard concept for for me to be able to acknowledge and accept that's for sure. I, I mean, like bad days are unavoidable. I think there's a perception out there where people, they try to have every day perfect and schedule every day just as they are. But I mean, like the world happens, like we're humans, like mistakes happen, things come up, whatever. Remaining fluid is probably the better ap- approach rather than expecting every day to go perfect. Yeah, a hundred percent. And um, I think just remaining fluid just encapsulates so many different concepts with regards to 
like my journey and just kind of being an athlete and like a high performer in any field for that matter. And um, yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a COVID year. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a year to practice being fluid, it was, <laughs> yeah. I'd imagine. Yeah. A hundred percent. Was there a time before COVID where you had to really remain fluid? I guess, I don't know like how crazy the, the skeleton scene was before COVID in terms of, you know, cancellations and uncertainty, but is, is there a time in your career where remaining fluid also helped you outside of the context of COVID? Yeah, for sure. I like, again, it applies to everything and, and anything. Like the one instance that really sticks out was, um, a, a while back now we were supposed to have a race in La Pong, Um, but the track was just super bumpy and they ended up, um, canceling the race and moving it to Eagles, Austria, where, um, long story short, I ended up hitting a broom. And so just kind of no pun intended, but brushing that run off and trying to then, um, refocus and put together another solid run. Um, and just kind of the outcome from that, you just, you just have to remain in that constant state of everything's going to be okay, regardless of the outcome. hundred percent. Because like, that's another thing too, that I try and really, especially with the younger athletes that I kind of consult or coach with, I think it's cool to think of specific scenarios that come up like day to day in your athlete that you can plan and prepare and prepare for, sorry, but there's also situations that come up that you can't plan and prepare for like a broom, for example. I remember seeing that when it happened, probably was Jay and Dan on their show sports center when that happened and seeing it, like that's something you can't come, you can't prepare for at all. Right. But it's the process. If we go back to the process, like the process of how to remain fluid, then you can kind of generalize that to other situations as they come up. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like all these concepts cross over from sports to like job life to oh, like everyday life. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. every time I talk to an athlete, they always tell me like, as they're able to be more confident in their sport, they're able to be more confident in their life just in general. And it, I think it even sets them up even better for after sports when they decide to retire, like that confidence that you build, it just, it permeates throughout your whole life. Yeah, it, it really does just, knowing that you you got through your hard days um like you <laughs> what's that line they say like you you've made it through 100 percent of your hard day so you'll make it through today or something like that yeah. so it, um yeah so like 100 percent like um yeah i think it all crosses over really well is is you mentioned you know still learning i think that's such a such a key concept as well um just in terms of the mental side of the game Because I think for any athlete, when they reach the the pinnacle of their sport, they still have to improve. They still have to adapt and whatnot. For you specifically, is there a specific part? I know we've talked a lot about remaining fluid and whatnot, and kind of that still is an ongoing goal for you. But is there anything else mentally that you're really trying to just focus on right now? Or even like healthy habits or something that you're trying to integrate into your life more and more um, as you think about 2021 and, and forward? Yeah, I think... Um, remaining open to um, any kind of opportunity that arises with regards to, it could be f- for work um, or for even like equipment testing um, for, for sports and skeleton. Um, but just remaining open and optimistic to any opportunity that does arise. And like, if it works out great, if not, that's also okay. Like it's a, a growth opportunity regardless of how the cookie crumbles. Yeah. I, it just made me think back to like, just maybe a couple of years ago, how many opportunities I could have been given. And just like my first instinct is to say no, and I just run with it. Right. And it's hard, I think, cause like the older we get kind of our learning history gets more ingrained and ingrained into us where like, we kind of maybe have an idea of what's going to work and what doesn't work. But like you said, like that openness and optimism, like there's so many people, I bet you that they have an opportunity that comes by and their first instinct is, is to say no for whatever reason. They could be scared. They could be fearful that it won't work out, but you don't know until you try. And I think that's such also like one of those important lessons, not only in sports, but life in general. Like if you don't try, you don't know if it's going to work or not. So you might as well, like, what's the worst thing that could happen type of thing? Yeah, hundred percent. And I always like to live, um, life with no regrets. I never want to look back and think, Oh, what if I did that? Or what if I had tried that? And so 
every moment, um, every opportunity I want to take advantage of and learn as much as I can from it. And um, it'll, it'll make you a better person or yeah. like build character if, if not in the long run. That's, that's like, it hits home to heart so much because like, that's the exact reason why I started this podcast. Cause I, like I had the idea for so long, for so long, I wanted to do something like this. Like I'm so passionate about sports, so passionate about psychology and human behavior and just the mental side of everything. And then I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk on social media. He's like the short guy from New York. He's like a huge entrepreneur marketer guy. And he has a lot of videos like this about like not regretting anything and following your passion just one day. Like I was definitely scared when I started this, like started messaging athletes. I don't know. They don't know who I am. 99 out of hundred of them say no, but again, it's like the one that says yes. And then you just build on it, build on it. I think a nice bridge there between sports and just life in general about just take a chance with something. And if you like it, like whether or not the outcome is the way you expected it to be, I think as long as somebody out there takes a chance on something and they just enjoyed the process, like that's, that's a win. Anything else is extra. A hundred percent. Yeah. And like, you'll never know unless you ask. And so if someone says no, like you're no better off or you're no worse off than you were beforehand. Right. right? right. So it's, it, I think it's just a matter of people are afraid of failure. And I think there's so much to be learned from failing that um, people shouldn't be afraid of it, but rather, I mean, embrace it to an extent, but obviously try to succeed um, through those and take take what you can and leave the rest, so to speak. That never really came up for you when you had started in, in the sport of skeleton. Again, it being such a new sport, those, those thoughts really never crossed your mind. I know we talked about kind of like the backstory behind it, some of the inspiration. Did, was that like, did you have like literally full self-confidence and just fully accepting like this just may fall flat on my face? Oh yeah. Like a hundred percent. Like it was, <laughs> it it was one of those moments, um, looking back, I was reflecting on it the other day actually, and thinking like, what was actually going through my head at the time when I decided that this was what I wanted to do. And I don't actually remember, unfortunately, but, um, it, it was just one of those things where if, if it didn't work out, then that's fine. Like it's an experience and it was like, it would, it was fun and it's a story. Um, but at the same time, if, if on the off chance it did work out, like, like it has, then where could I take it? Where could I go with it? And so it's, it's just kind of taking that leap of faith and trust again, trusting the process, um, that, that this is where you should be right now in time. I remember, um, was it 2021, maybe about five or six years ago, uh, when I was at McMaster university, they had a bunch of like, uh, bobsled trials going on for the Canadian team or maybe it was Ontario, but I went to it and I tried out for some of them. Didn't go so well. I got injured and whatnot. But for me, like thinking about going into a sport that I was so new to and had so little experience with, I mean, how many people grow up bobsledding? Probably not a lot. But for me, really what the, like the drive was, was like the opportunity to represent like my country on some sort of stage. Like that's got to be just all the motivation an athlete needs in their life is to be able to like say you're on an international stage, representing your country, representing your friends and family. I think even just the 1% shot of doing that should be enough motivation for any athlete out there to, to tackle any sort of like international sport dream that they have. A hundred percent. Like anybody that enters an Olympic sport thinking in the back of their mind that they, that's not the end game. That's not the end goal. Like they'd be lying. (laughs) So, um, of course that was always in the back of your mind and, um, being from Vancouver and getting to experience the Vancouver 2010 Olympics and just witnessing firsthand what it was like to even just be a spectator and be a part of something bigger than myself was just so, so incredible and so inspiring. And so I knew I wanted to be a part of that movement, witnessing that, that Olympic movement firsthand and, wanting to be a part of it in some way, shape and form. I didn't know what it was going to look like at the time, but, um, and so when I got, when I was fortunate enough to be, to be named to the 2018 Pyeongchang Olympic uh, Canadian team, it was so incredible and so special that I got to share that experience with my family. Um, they all came over and, um, just, Ugh, it was, I can't even put it into words how cool and how exciting and like how full my heart was that they were there. 
it's a once in a lifetime thing, eh? Like, yeah, it really like, is. Whether it's sports, outside of sports, life, job, whatever it is, I think when somebody feels like those feelings that you just described there, like that's when you know that you've done something right in your life. Like, this, like you know that this is all worth it. Like, this is like your purpose, almost, so to say. A hundred percent, and that's totally it. It's like. It, it just like validates those, all of those hard days. It validates all those tough days when you're homesick or when you're having all these days of self-doubt. It's like, no, I was supposed to go through those so that I could get here. And it's, it's just such an incredible um, feeling. And you, you take away so much from, from those days and from those moments. When you started in, in the sport back in 2011, you had mentioned that you, everyone has the, that that ultimate goal of getting to the Olympics for you, was it a challenge to block that out? Cause I think for a lot of athletes out there, they can get too caught up in that outcome per se. Like we were going back before a process outcome. Like I think for a lot of athletes, when they first start a sport or they start to get to that semi elite level, they start to have kind of, they, they, they look past what's the challenge in front of them for you personally. Was that a, a challenge for you that you had to overcome or was it something that, based on what we've talked about before and your past experience in sports that you were already primed to kind of deal with and to, to, to overcome? Honestly, I don't think anyone's ever really primed and ready for that qualifying year or those qualifying races, whatever it is that you have to hit or do in order to, to be named to the, and make the team. But so it was definitely a challenge. That's for sure. Just trying to, again, I, I got caught up in all of it. And I remember it was just, I had a few really bad um, seasons because I had put so much pressure on myself. Once I had that success, it was like, no, like I need to be the best of the best in training, in competition, everything. And it's like, no, like that's okay. You don't have to be the best right. of the best all the time. Like you just have to be um, the best that you can be in that moment. And sometimes it's good enough and sometimes it's not, but that's okay. And so it's just a matter of perception, I think. Um, but when I was uh, sliding back on the the Canadian team back in 2013, 2014, I was fortunate enough to be able to be um, teammates and sliding alongside, um, so, sorry, sliding alongside bleh, um, with, John Montgomery and Melissa Hollingsworth right before they went to the Sochi Olympics in 2014. And so getting to see their processes firsthand um, and seeing, I guess, almost their reactions in their, with, with the, with everything that, that was being tossed at them, it was super interesting and I learned so much from it. Um, but again, witnessing it is completely different than experiencing it. And so I was only prepared so much um, leading into the 2018 Olympics um, as well. Everyone on that team Canada for skeleton had was, were rookies. We'd never been to the Olympics before. So it was a really cool um, special experience to get to, ex to, to have this first with all of them. And now moving into the 2022 Beijing Olympics, I feel like we are all a lot more prepared. We know what to expect. And um, I feel like it'll be a different ball game moving into that year. Did you find that when you had that opportunity to, to train with other sliders in 13, 14, did you find that their process maybe was less complicated than you thought it would be? Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. Like I thought that, um, I mean, I didn't know what to think, but it was, their process was not what I thought it was. That's for sure. And so, um, it was, it was super insightful and interesting in the fact that like, perhaps I now looking back, actually, now that you mentioned it, I'm like reflecting a bit now and I a hundred percent overcomplicated things. And instead of just letting things like getting back to it, letting things flow and be fluid and be natural, I was creating all of these complicated scenarios that didn't exist and it was me fighting myself against it so yeah and i mean you know mm -hmm. to 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 full circle this podcast is getting back to the basics like when you see someone like john montgomery who i mean the number of medals that he's won throughout his career to see the success that he has with probably such a more simplified version of the process that some other athletes have i mean i think that just puts that gives you all the evidence you need that it's like it's just the basic process and if you start there. And if you can master that, I think the rest just falls into place. 
a hundred percent. Like, and it's funny that you, you say to master that, cause I don't think anyone can really master the ability to have fun. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, it's always, a, uh, and that's when it gets back to the process and just like, whenever you feel like, whenever I feel like I'm getting caught up with things, um, I really try to just take a step back and just breathe through it. Like acknowledge that like, okay, I'm feeling these feelings right now, but it's going to be okay. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, my friends and family are still going to love me regardless of the outcome. And they're going to know that I tried the best I could for that day. And, um, that's something that's really helped me to remain in that basic mindset, um, where they're going to want me to have fun. Yeah. So why should I not have fun? Exactly. And just how you mentioned, they're kind of like taking a step back, breathing, understanding the emotions that you're feeling in that specific moment. I feel like that's like accepting an emotion and processing it and dealing with it in a, in a positive manner, I guess, is such a more um, beneficial process than just pushing the emotion to the side. Such a more beneficial process to accept the emotion and to push it to a side. I just see so many athletes, younger athletes that I talk to, they feel these certain emotions and they have no one to open up to and they don't have the skills to process them, process it themselves. Um, and I think it's just like that negative feedback loop that happens that the more that you push away the emotions, the harder it is to deal with them. I really like how you mentioned there though. I think that's a really practical tip for, for people to take from this podcast is when you feel any sort of emotion that could potentially be overwhelming, take a step back, breathe, do some sort of breathing exercise, count to 10, whatever it may be accept the emotion, understand why it's happening and just know that like, it's going to be okay. Like one, one little moment doesn't define you as a person and your emotions. Like just, you can get past it and move on. A thousand percent. And that's just, again, it's allowing yourself that time to be able to take that moment and to allow yourself to process it. And it may take minutes. It could take hours. It doesn't, there is no timeline to it, but it's, it's a matter of um, that recognition process and it's going to be okay. And, um, yeah, that's, that's something that I was working with, um, on through the summertime is I would just kind of compartmentalize things and it would just build up, build up. And then it would just, the summer just kind of, again, having that time on my own, I just working through those like emotions. I don't know how many times I cried at night. Good gosh. But, um, but it's like, that's okay. That's emotion. And like, you have that emotion because it means something to you. And so, um, yeah, it's just letting yourself be in that moment and work through, um, and, and experience it to its fullest. I think that's, um, that's a beautiful spot to, to end this conversation with some real practical tips for other athletes out there and probably other people that aren't even competing in sport, but just the whole process or, or the whole notion story of, of how to process emotions and just being okay and accepting them. I think that's, that's a beautiful way to end this off. I appreciate your time, Jane. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you. I mean, I had a lot of fun, a lot of insightful tips for not only other athletes, but myself, I definitely took one or two really key things that I can integrate into my daily practice. So appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I, it was a fun conversation to have hundred percent. So thank you.